to Proverbs, the 25th chapter. Proverbs, the 25th chapter. And we're going to start our lesson today, verse 28. Does everyone have your scriptures ready? So follow with me today as I read Psalm, the 20, it's Proverbs, the 25th chapter, and verse 28. Ready? Let's go. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Notice that in the scripture. I want to follow with me again as I read. Proverbs, the 25th chapter, and verse 28. Like a city. So we're being compared, a person is being compared to a city. A city that has walls. Walls serve as protection. Walls of our life are seen through self-control. And here it says, if I lack self-control, my walls are broken down. The walls of my life, my family, my life is broken down. A person can have a lot of great attributes. They can be a very hardworking person. They can have all kinds of acts of generosity. But if they lack self-control, they're compared to in Scripture as a city whose walls are broken down. And so let's look today at what it means, self-control. In a person's life, there's either two people, there's only, there can only be one or two people or powers that are in control. In your life, there's only one of two powers that are in control, period. Either you or God. There's only two powers that can be in control of your life. Either you or God. That's it. You say, no, there's people in control of my life. No, you let others control you. Therefore, you are in control of your life. And if you're in control of your life, then your walls are going to break down. Because we, as people, we have limited wisdom. We have limited strength. We are limited. That's a word that describes all of us. We are all people who are limited. We're limited in our abilities. We're limited in our thinking. We're limited in our knowledge. Everything that we do in life, we're limited by this body, this mind. And if I'm in control, then my life is going to have its limitations. Yes? You're going to have limitations. Every one of us will suffer from our own weaknesses. One person, we're going to look at that today. One person will suffer from a weakness of their lack of control of their tongue. Another person will lack their control of an emotion. Maybe anger, bitterness, hatred, rage. Everyone has problems in this room. We all do. We all have problems. Another person is laziness. So we could just name all these that we've talked about. And if you're in control of your life, then you're going to fail. I'm going to fail. We all fail. Our walls will be broken down. They will be weak. They won't be strong. They won't be able to endure. But if God's in control, then God is going to give me the strength I need. God's going to give me the wisdom I need. God is going to give me what I need in life. So the question is, who is in control? So we spin around. I feel like I'm on some kind of game show. We're on a wisdom show. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. Who is in control? Let me read this interesting scripture. Uh, Fred's not going to make it. I'm sorry to hear that. So let me turn Fred off for a minute. Romans, the seventh chapter. This text talks about a battle that's ongoing and the life of a Christian. It's a struggle. It's a struggle of control. Your life is about a struggle to control. And here we find the Apostle Paul. He is talking about his struggle to control. In the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, look at what he says in verse 15. He says, I do not understand what I do. That's an interesting way to begin the scripture, isn't it? Look at what he says in Romans, the 7th chapter, verse 15. He says, 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But yet, can we not all say, I kind of get that. Paul says, the things that I hate are often the things I end up doing. And oftentimes the things that I learn about on Sundays, and in my heart, in my desire, I, I think I'm going to start practicing these things. I'm going to start following in the footsteps of Jesus. Those are my desires, but the things that I want to do is not really what I'm doing. The Apostle Paul, in other words, was saying, who's in control here? And that's the whole point of today's lesson is, who's in control? Now, in Proverbs, going back then to our study, our, chap our chapter 25, it says, a person who lacks self-control, the walls of their life are going to be broken. You're never going to be what God wants you to be if you're in control. There's many Christians today they attempt to control their life and control their destiny. And it's a foolish way to live. That's why the scripture says in Proverbs 9, chapter verse 6, forsake the foolish and live. Interesting. Forsake the foolish. What's that mean? Forsake trying to control your life because we need God in control. He is in control when his word is given first place. He is in control when we're filled by the Spirit of God and not the things of this world. In Ephesians, in Ephesians, we find these words, and I'm going to turn to the fifth chapter if you'd like to join with me. I should have had you turn there as well when you're in Romans. You are very close. You're on the same spiritual continent. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, look at verse 15 with me. Verse 15 of Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Notice that, underline it if you have your own Bible. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 15. Be very careful. Be very careful. That means be humble. Don't overestimate who you are, and don't underestimate who God is. That's what it lives to be careful. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Make the most of time. God's going to give you opportunities. Make the most of them. It goes on, it says, in verse 17, oh, it says, because the days were evil, verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now the focus of this scripture that I want to look at, verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to botchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What's the focus of this scripture? The focus of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 is this. Be careful who is in control. An example, an example here in Ephesians says, don't get drunk on wine. That is, don't let wine or some other substance control your life. Because if it controls you, it will influence every decision you make. However, if the Spirit of God is in control of your life, He is going to influence every direction you make. And when God is in control, you'll live a wise life. Making the most of every opportunity. Don't be foolish, the Bible says. Don't be foolish. Don't make the mistake of missing this point. Who is in control of my life? Ask that question today and think about it. Just on your church, think about it all day long. Who's really in control of your life? It's either God or it's you. Now you can choose to put your life in other people's hands or other things. Could be alcohol. That's your choice. Or it could be other people, right? Other people, sometimes you live your life by the dictates of a mom, a dad, or some other person, a friend. That's your choice. But either you or God is in control. But you can't do both. Jesus said you can't do both. You have a house, that's your life. Either you're going to serve God with it or you're going to serve man or 
serve yourself. Let's look at what the scripture warns us about. Proverbs, going back to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. We touch on many subjects today, of which I think I can write a check mark. If you ever remember multiple choice questions, well, Landon's still in school. We're all in the school of life, but you know, you get those multiple choice questions, and it's like, which one is correct? A, and it says this, B, C, D. And finally, or E, all the above. Well, when I was preparing for this lesson today, I just went down and hit E, all the above. Because I can't say that I have avoided any of these. Nevertheless, God's word stands true. And I'm not going to be an hypocrite here, though oftentimes I am. I have failed in many ways in my life. And I, like you, are all on a journey with God. And God is, he's working on us. And first of all, it says here in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Now, I've heard it debated. I was sitting in church one time. The pastor got angry with me. He made the declaration and said, If you believe it's all right to drink a glass of wine, you're not a Christian. It's not a point about what's right or wrong here. The scriptures, what it's saying is, who's in control of your life? Be careful. Because, because it's just not about wine, it's about this. And here it is. What it boils down to is the flesh versus the spirit. What is the flesh in scripture? It's human nature. We're all born with a human nature. We're all born with a nature that has weaknesses. Some people, have a weakness to steal. Yes? I, I, I need to labor on that, but you understand we all are born with a human nature, and that human nature is opposed to God in many ways. That's why God gave us a look over here to the wall where we have our Ten Commandments. It says, for example, honor God by honoring your father and your mother. Did we ever disobey our mom and dad and cause them grief? I know I did. Yes? We all have. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, and so forth. God gave us his commandments. We all have failed God's commandments. These commandments tell us how God wants us to live. And it's by the power of God, it's by the presence of God, his spirit that he's given us, that he now gives us the new desire to do those commandments. Don't make a mistake. We are not called to live by these Ten Commandments so that we'll be the children of God or other commandments. We are the children of God by the birth of His Spirit so that now we have the desire to do His commandments. There's a big difference. If you are trying to become the children of God or becoming religious so that you might be part of God's family, you'll never do it. Does everybody follow that? You can't. You can't. Become the child of God by washing your outside. God washes you on the inside by the spiritual rebirth. And by His Spirit inside us, He begins the process of what's called sanctification. He's changing us so that we're set apart for God's use. So, it's a question in the scriptures here in Proverbs. It's not about a debate. Someone says, well, is this wrong or is this right? It's, here's the question. Who's in control of your life? Now, for some person, they drink a glass of wine with their meal, or they, they grow up in a Mediterranean country, and by the age of 12, if they're in Israel, probably they're drinking wine. It's not a question, did God give wine? I believe in the scripture, Jesus performed a miracle in the New Testament where he turned the water to wine. The question is, be careful of everything in life because it can either be for your good and enjoyment, or it can easily control you and destroy you. So be very careful of everything. Let's keep going on. Here it says, be careful. Now I could have said any drug, right? Any drug. Be careful of any substance that can control you. Let's keep going on. Proverbs 23, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 2. Do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Look at verse 2. I'm sorry. 
Verse 2, chapter 23, verse 2. And put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Boy, I'm, I didn't know, I haven't put a knife to my throat because my, knife, my, my throat would be heavily scarred. I say that jokingly, but here's another point. Did God give us food? Certainly He did. Yes. But be careful because food destroys people. Anything that will control your life other than the Spirit of God, if you allow that to control your life, whether it be wine or whether it be food, even food destroys a many a person. I know I, in the past I've made, and after I had um, this accident, I'll be very truthful, I, I'm really consciously making an effort to eat differently. I still enjoy eating, but I am. I, I've always loved, I've always been a huge eater. Samantha knows that, you know, it makes pork chops and mashed potatoes and peas. If she just keeps putting it down in front of me, I'll just keep eating. <laughs> but I, I, I am, after the lady said to me, the cardiologist, and I've read reports saying, if you want to stay out eight, then you need to do your part. And you need to maybe ease back on eating and, and take better control of your life. And I thought, you know, that's true. It's very true. I need to be very cautious. And I can laugh about it all I want about being a huge eater, but nevertheless, Proverbs says, you're foolish if you let gluttony overpower your life. It's true. It's just like anything else in life. Problem I have a lot of times with myself and other Christians, myself, let's just talk about Paul. We have our list of things. I have my list, right, growing up. You have your list of sins. And you say... I won't do that, I won't do that. You've got like three, you only got a hand and five fingers, so it's, that kind of makes it nice. You know, you just limit to these five things. And I, I won't do these things. But if you do, you're worse than I am. Right? We pick our sins. We pick the things that's kind of like the things that don't really, like for me, I could say, well, I'm going to have a problem with gambling, so I'll put that up there because that's really not a weakness for me. They say, someone says, well, how about gluttony? Oh, well, I only got five fingers here. Let's just limit to these things, right? I'm making a joke out of it, but the point is, is a lot of times we just like to focus on the things we we say we're not doing, and then we find fault with everybody else. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Let's keep going on. Laziness. We've talked about some of these subjects already. Chapter 14, verse 23. Look at chapter 14 and verse 23. All hard work brings a profit. I love that scripture. All hard work brings a profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. A lot of people like that, right? They, they can talk the talk. I know in companies, you know, everybody wants to be the executive manager. What's that mean? You sit in an office and you got the computer on and you sit there and type away. I see it all the time. People just typing away. Fingers just busy, busy, busy. In a factory, it could be falling apart, but everybody's busy. They're putting spreadsheets together, and they're typing reports, and everybody's looking at a computer screen. And I always ask all the people that have experience and kind of know what they're doing, I think, they're all behind the computer. Who's running this show? Who's in control? <laughs> a lot of people talking the talk, but actually, who's doing the hard work? It's a poor person out in the factory, right? And they don't have any good instruction or can, they don't have anybody teaching and working with them because all the people that should be doing that, they're in an office somewhere typing behind a computer. How about this one? Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Verse 20. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? The scripture tells us that sex, uncontrolled sex. Now, has sex been given to us by God? It has, right? Yes. The union of a man and a woman and the birth of a family, it has its place in marriage. But immorality destroys many a person's life. When sex is out of control, it destroys people's lives, it destroys people's homes, and it will lead a person to destruction. Will wine? Yes. Will food? Yes. The point is, as we go down this list, 
Proverbs teaches on all these subjects saying be careful. The question is, who's in control of your life? Because if God's not in control of your life, your walls are going to break apart. Your life will fall apart. Let's continue on. Chapter 25, verse 11. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. That's a beautiful picture. What are words aptly spoken? They're appropriate. They're at the right time. They're words given to a situation that are meaningful. Not to tear down, but to build up. Words of encouragement. Words of wisdom and direction. The point is is that what's in control of your life. Sometimes people's lips are in control. Lips to just always be spitting off anger, spitting off criticism. Our lips sometimes control the ship. Is that true? It is. Sometimes people's lips control their life. They, can't, they cannot shut up. They cannot be quiet. I think some people, if you said the ship is going to sink if you don't shut up, Just like another person, the ship is going to sink if you don't quit eating. The point is, I, I make light of it, but the truth is, our walls of life, they break down when we're in control. And when we're in control, it's always manifest. It either, and one last one, look at what, there's two more points I want to make, and then we're going to close. Look at Proverbs, the 16th chapter, verse 32. Better a patient man than a warrior. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? More important is it to have somebody that's, who's a patient person? Person in control. A person who's in control. We see all these, I heard the other day, two people got fight in a fight this week, I think it was. I think it was in Ohio. They got in a fight at a Walmart, Kroger's, whatever. I don't know where the store it was. They had a disagreement, two men, I think it was. The one man was so mad and rage, went outside, got in his car, had his revolver waiting. The other guy came out, they started trading bullets, and one man fell down dead. Maybe they were fighting over apples. Yeah, fighting over some donuts. One man probably had a family. He don't go home anymore to his wife and his kids. He died because he got in a fight and a rage over donuts. You see, the point is this. There's a lot of warriors. You think of a man or a woman. You think of a patriot in a country. Oh, we need more warriors. But actually, we, we need people who are controlled. Controlled by God's direction. Controlled by God's wisdom. God's strength. That's what we need. A lot of people, I see it all the time. I saw politicians. There's a politician right now in trouble. And we all get in trouble with our mouths. I keep on going back and forth between subjects. But there's a man right now, a politician. He went off and started saying all these things about politicians, that they're having all these big sex parties, they're on drugs, criticizing as the Republican Party. And as if, you, if you've been watching the news, he's, he's throwing all these words out. They've come back all these people said, wait a minute, you who've been rising in your political party, you took the liberty of using your lips to try to gain popularity in what you're saying are lies. Now, whether he's right or wrong, you see what the point is? People need to practice self-control with their lips, with their actions, because if you don't, your walls will fall down. And our country is a great example of political parties, presidents. We've seen so many presidents, they couldn't practice control. They let other things control them. Here the scripture says that we need to be careful of our emotions, right? Chapter 16, verse 32. A man who controls his temper is better than one who takes a city. We often say, well, he loses his temper. Well, that's one thing you can't lose, <laughs> right? It's always there with you, your temper. And how do you behave to things, accidents, or a person's comments, or situations? Are you a person where God is in control, or are you in control? If you're in control, you take matters in your hands, and quickly your mouth is running, or your fists are running, or something, you're taking something in your own hands, you're acting out of jealousy, you're acting out of rage, your emotions are controlling you, and God is not 
in control. Let's continue on. Emotions. And then next week, uh, I'm, I'm ask Samantha, she's actually going to be spending time on this, but I just want to introduce this subject. The 22nd chapter, look at verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. What's it speaking of? It's speaking of the control that money has on people. It causes people, when money is the power of your life, it's in control, you start living very dishonestly. You start treating people unfairly, take advantage of the poor, take advantage of situations. Greed becomes the control of your life. There's a lot of people who that allow greed to destroy them. They started to be dishonest. They started to break apart. They're, they're no longer a person of an integrity. You see, all these things that we've talked about, I think we've talked about seven different examples here. And I'm not saying which of these are the greatest of sins. Because does money, can money be a good? Yes, right? The Bible says that if you, out of love, tithe and give to God cheerfully, He will cause your barns to overflow with things that He's going to give you. Does God want to give you those things? Yes. There's nothing wrong with having an abundance of things, but don't let the abundance of things become that which controls you. Yes. That's the point. Everything that we've talked about today, whether, you know, we went on even uh, our language, our tongues, God gave us tongues. Just because you're speaking or using your mouth, that doesn't mean, actually, if you're using your tongue to praise God and to give words of encouragement, words of wisdom, words of constructive uh, discipline, those are the things God wants you to use your lips for. But, if you let your lips, because you have this motivation, you want to be in control, you want to be the one who's dictating what other people do, and all that matters is your opinion, then you're going to destroy yourself and destroy others. The point is this. Who is in control? Who is in control of your life? I think Proverbs is one of the greatest books in the whole Bible that asks that question. Who is in control? Who is in control of this church? Many churches today, they're empty. I'm not saying this truth. You know why? Because at one point, that church probably had a lot of people in it. But then there started growing divisions. This group of people, they wanted it done this way. I remember a lot of times when I first started preaching, people come up to me and they say, they'd have a list of things. I actually sat down with dinner one time. They said, you know why we come to your church? I said, no, why? She said, because it's comical. I said, oh, why? You know what they said? I said, my wife says it's comical. Well, she says, she's never heard a person use such worse grammar than you do. And she just finds it so funny to listen to you. And I thought, well, that's nice. Pass the potatoes. All right? Thanks for inviting me out to dinner. One person used to sit, come up and he'd say, Paul, I made a note of all the things I think you said that were wrong. You might want to look these over. Was that hurtful? He sure was. Now, if a person with their same lips would have come up to me privately and said, Paul, boy, I, I really love to listen to you today, but, you know, there's something you said there, and maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. You know, there's a good way to hurt somebody for their good. Or if you're that person who's in control, God's not in control, and you enjoy being hurtful because a lot of people are in church. That's why a lot of churches do fall apart and they do divide because people are running the show and we can't forget who's to be running this show. Jesus. If he's not running this ship, then we are here in vain. It's not about your wedding. You have your opinions and I have mine. But when we walk through those doors, actually when you gave your life to Jesus, what should have happened and what should happen every day is that I take my opinions and I take my thoughts and I say, search me, O God. And if you find any offensive way, any offensive way in me, I'll be the first to say I'm wrong. God help me to change. I want you in control because if you're not in control, what's going to happen in my life and my family? The walls are going to break down. You're just going to have troubles. I'm going to have troubles. Your family's going to have troubles. This church is going to have troubles and splits. We're not here today.
because we want to talk about our ways. Jesus said, I am the way. Right? He didn't leave it up to us to discuss. His word, God's word, has been given to us. Look, 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 let me read this scripture because it's part of the chapter I'm going to focus on today. If I make it upstairs, there's no guarantees. Psalm chapter 18. And then, I think we're out of time, but let, let me read this scripture. Psalm chapter 18, verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. As for God, His way is perfect. And then what it, it goes on to say, And the word of the Lord is flawless. Are my words flawless? No, that's not me. Are my ways perfect? No. But God's ways are. Therefore, therefore, Proverbs is teaching us this. The whole body of the book of Proverbs is this. Who's in control? Who's in control of your life? Either God is, or you are. I think that's uh, almost 11.45, uh, 10.45, so I think we're ready to go upstairs. God bless you. It's been good to be with you today.